Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are throughout the world, welcome to OCP's webinar, Introducing New Mass Settings, A Pastoral Approach. I'm Ken Canedo, Music Development Specialist for OCP, and with me is my friend and colleague Scott Crandall, a pastoral musician at the Episcopal Parish of St. John the Baptist here in Portland, Oregon. I'm also a pastoral musician at Holy Trinity Church in Beaverton, Oregon. That's my parish. I've been there for about 10 years. I've been involved in liturgical music just about all my life. It's my great pleasure to be here with you as we share ideas on introducing new mass settings. Well, thank you once again for joining us. Um, this is an important topic, uh, mass settings. How to introduce and teach a mass setting to your choir and to your parish. Uh, before we get started on some practical ideas for that, I'd like to share some uh, teachings from uh, the general instruction of the Roman Missal, the importance of singing the Mass text. Now, in uh, paragraph 40 of the general instruction, it says, in choosing the parts of the Mass actually to be sung, preference is to be given to those that are of greater importance and especially to those which are to be sung by the priest or the deacon or the reader, with the people replying, or by the priest and people together. Now, what they're saying in the general instruction is the most important parts of the Mass that are to be sung are the dialogue, the Lord be with you by the priest, and with your spirit, response by the people. You know, here, especially in the United States, we've kind of fallen into this pattern of thinking that it's the four hymns that are the most important parts of the Mass to be sung. The entrance song, the preparation of the gifts, the communion, the sending forth song. We kind of fell into that pattern in the 1960s when we first changed the Mass into English. But the actual most important parts of the Mass are the dialogue. And, you know, this is something from... Uh, if you have the next slide, please. Sing to the Lord, Music and Divine Worship, uh, a commentary on liturgy by the United States Catholic bishops. The acclamations of the Eucharistic liturgy and other rites arise from the whole gathered assembly as a sense to God's word and action. The Eucharistic acclamation include the gospel acclamation, the sanctus, the holy, holy, the mystery of faith, and the great amen. They are appropriately sung at any Mass, including daily Mass, and any Mass with a smaller congregation. Ideally, the people should know the acclamations by heart and should be able to sing them readily, even without accompaniment. So you're all pastor musicians, you know what I'm talking about, what we used to call the uh, ordinary of the Mass. Sometimes we refer to them as the parts of the Mass. We also call them the Mass setting. The Lord have mercy, the glory to God, the Alleluia, or Lenten Gospel Acclamation, the Holy Holy, the Mysteries of Faith, what we used to call the Memorial Acclamation, the Amen, the Our Father, the Doxology, the Lamb of God. These acclamations, these dialogues, are the most important things to sing at Mass. If there is only one song you want to sing at Mass, that you are able to sing, that would be the holy, holy, holy. I'll talk a little bit about that later. So we need to kind of change our way of thinking from the four hymns to embracing the parts of the Mass, the acclamations, the actual ritual text of the liturgy. There are many pastoral considerations to think about um, as far as choosing a Mass setting. First of all, how many Mass settings does your parish need? You know, each parish is different. I'm not going to give you an outline or give you a dramatic proclamation of how many you need. You know your parish. Ideally, you can go anywhere from changing mass settings every Sunday to changing your mass setting once a year. But I think it's practical to think in terms of seasons uh, to, to kind of allow your people to learn and really embrace the mass setting that you're teaching them. Keep it every Sunday for at least one liturgical season during the longer ordinary time, maybe split that up. But that means you might need three, four, or five mass settings throughout the liturgical year. Think about what are the pastoral needs of your community? Does your parish sing? 
Is your parish just starting to sing? Uh, what are the age demographics of your parish? What are the cultural demographics of your parish? You know, some cultures are more readily sing out from their heart than other cultures. Uh, some age groups are very shy about singing. So all these come into play in how you choose a mass setting for your parish. Can a new mass setting help your parishioners to grow in their participation as a singing community? This is the beauty of mass settings, of using the actual text of the mass because they are repeated Sunday after Sunday, people can learn how to sing through singing these official texts. The familiarity of it em empowers them to sing and to participate. So yes, I think a new mass setting can help your parishioners to grow in their participation depending how well you select that setting. And what about stylistic considerations? Do you need to be aware of things like um, does your parish prefer contemporary music? Does your parish prefer traditional music? A blend of both. You know, how does your parish worship in song? Again, you know best. A publisher like OCP, we uh, put out a whole slate of mass settings in various styles, in various languages, and we just want to offer all that to the worshiping community, but it's your choice your understanding of your community, you know best. We'll offer the offerings, but you know best how to choose one. So just keep all these things in mind. Uh, consider the liturgical season when planning out your mass settings for the year. Now, um, for example, Lent's coming up. Lent is a penitential season, a time that's a bit more reflective. I know some parishes like to use the Latin Gregorian chant mass for Lent. Terrific or uh, they'll use a setting that is a bit more subdued, more reflective, and when we go to the Easter season, they'll go and pull out a mass setting that's a lot more joyful, a lot more uh, proclamative, you know, to, to celebrate the res resurrection of Christ. Um, here's something to consider. Consider mass settings that can be sung by the choirs and assemblies of all your weekend liturgies, regardless of style. You know, I'm always amused to uh, look at the marquee in front of any Catholic church, and you see a whole list of different times for Mass. 6.30 Mass, no music. 8 o'clock Mass, uh, children's choir, 10 o'clock Mass, family choir, 12 o'clock Mass, Spanish choir, 2 o'clock Mass, Korean choir, and never shall the twain meet. I like to suggest that if you want to unify all the different communities of your parish, sing one mass setting throughout. You know, teach all the choirs the same mass settings and stay with that that season as a way to unite the parish, different communities in the parish. What about multilingual mass settings? That's precisely why publishers publish multilingual mass settings, and we'll talk about that a little later. We're going to try a multi multilingual mass setting. There are challenges to that. Um, there are some uh, Bilingual, you know, by Spanish and English, Filipino and English, there are some all Spanish mass settings. Can we combine them somehow? Again, you know your parish best. You know how to um, be a pastoral musician to help your parish participate in song. And then there's a question that comes up. What about Latin mass settings? Latin remains the official language of the Roman Catholic Church. There is a body of uh, Latin chants that are universally sung throughout the whole church. We're going to demonstrate one of those a little later. And even if your community uh, is, has, has a leaning towards contemporary music, it would be good to uh, include at least one Latin mass setting in your uh, repertoire. Why? As a sign of unity with the whole church. Whenever you see Mass in the Vatican, like uh, Pope Francis's Midnight Mass at Christmas, you'll notice they sing in Latin. And there's certain things they sing that uh, the whole church knows, that Latin chant Mass. So I think that's important, something to consider. How about teaching a Mass setting? OK, we get to the heart of what we're doing here. And, you know, I'm just sharing ideas. You'll have room for questions a little later. If you have questions, please feel to type them in. Um, but the heart of our presentation, the heart of our webinar this morning is teaching a mass setting. Now, 
it's important to keep in mind that uh, choirs, cantors, and musicians have a very instrumental part, pun intended, in allowing the people, in enabling the people, empowering the people to sing a new mass setting. So I suggest choirs, cantors, and musicians need to master the new setting before presenting it to the assembly. Rehearse early and often. If you know you're going to be doing a certain mass setting in the Easter season, for example, now is the time to order that music and start rehearsing it in your Wednesday night rehearsal or whatever day of the week you rehearse. So that by the time Easter comes, your musicians have mastered that mass setting. There won't be any hesitation when you teach it to the people. Um, people don't think about this, but yes, use the Sunday Bulletin and the parish website to announce to your people that you're going to teach a new mass setting. A few weeks beforehand, put that in the Bulletin, okay? And then put a link on your parish website to where that mass setting resides on the publisher's website. I have a page here I'm going to show you in a minute. If we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is the page in OCP.org on the revised mass setting for Mass of Glory, uh, the mass setting that Bob Hurd and I did. And uh, you can see, if you look at the right corner, look and listen, if you put that link, look at the top of the page, there's a link uh, www.ocp.org slash mass settings. Just copy that into your website as a link, a hot link. Then your people can go to this page and click on the right side there, Glory to God, Holy, we proclaim. They click on that and they can hear it on their devices. It's wonderful. And also down below, there's a playlist if people want to purchase the actual playlist and keep it in their device. So. This is one way to get the people to start hearing the mass setting, to be aware that a new, new mass setting is on the way. Okay, a very easy thing to do. Preview the new mass setting. Okay, what do I mean by that? Play some of the themes of the new mass setting at mass a few weeks before you're actually going to introduce it. Play it as an instrumental prelude. I don't mean play it fast but take that melody, maybe take the flute and the guitar, or flute and piano, and play the theme of the holy, for example, or the theme of the refrain for the glory to God as an instrumental prelude as the people are walking in. And then a few weeks before you actually teach the mass heading, have your choir sing the holy, holy, holy as a postlude. After the sending forth song, the people are walking out of church, having people sing the Holy Holy, I mean the choir sing the Holy Holy, or the Alleluia. So again, people can hear that and then kind of plant that melody in them. So all these are ways you can help the people to get familiar with the melodies so they can own them. Now, another thing to keep in mind as you prepare your parish to learn a new mass setting is assembly resources. Um, Make sure you have the resources for your assembly to follow along as they learn the new setting. Words and music. Now many mass settings are in fact in Breaking Bread or Today's Missile. There's no problem there. Uh, but there are some mass settings that you might want to use that aren't in those uh, worship resources. Now the question is, well you know most people don't read music. Well many do. At the very least the notes give an indication of the direction of the melody. Whether you use Breaking Bread or Today's Missile, or if your chosen mass setting doesn't appear in an OCP Missile, then you can create a homemade worship aid. Make sure, please, that you have copyright permission. Or where can you get all the uh, text and music to print in your homemade worship aid? That's very easy. Next slide, please. On OCP.org, if you look at the uh, left-hand column, it has like uh, uh, places where you can click, click mass settings, and then you, eventually you'll find this page, assembly editions now at licensing.org. After you choose a mass setting that might not be in Breaking Brad, and you want to uh, print out the assembly boxes and a homemade worship aid, this is how you can do it. I won't read it off for you, but it is here. It's very convenient after you purchase the Octavos for that mass setting. You have permission, but you have to apply for it here at licensing.org. 
uh, to make that homemade wish of aid. Very easy. It's a matter of uh, justice and compensation for the composer and for the church, which owns the mass text. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about teaching a new setting. Let's say you're going to choose Mass of Christ the Savior by Dan Schutte. Some of you might be doing this already. Uh, Dan Schutte, of course, is uh, very well known. He's one of the St. Louis Jesuits and one of the premier composers of the contemporary uh, Catholic uh, Church. And uh, what he has done here is created a mass setting when we went to the New Text in 2010, uh, which utilizes the New Text. And so, please, on the first Sunday, after you've prepared the people with the bulletin, website, preludes, postludes, and all that, begin not from the beginning. I know that sounds strange. People think, oh, I am so daunted by the need to teach a new mass setting. There are so many movements. Lord of mercy, glory to God, where do I begin? Don't start at the beginning. Especially don't start with the glory to God. Start with the holy, holy. Why is that? Because it's a self-contained unit there that usually has the central motif of the composer that he had in mind. Start with the holy. It is actually the most important part of the Mass to sing, and uh, it's a great place to start. And so what we usually do is on that first Sunday, maybe five minutes before Mass, and don't worry about the latecomers, five minutes before Mass, you go up and have your choir ready, and the cantor goes up to the podium or wherever the cantor usually sings, and says, good morning, good evening. Today we're going to learn a new mass setting. It's called Mass of Christ the Savior by Dan Schutte. And you find it in Breaking Bread, number 923. It sounds something like this. Some people, some cantors say, let's learn this song line by line. And that actually destroys, it's a nice idea, but actually, it actually destroys the idea of letting the people catch on to how the flow of the melody. So sing the whole thing first. Or if you want to break it up, sing it up to Blessed is He. Teach that first part, then teach Blessed is He till the end. So uh, put on the charm, smile. Don't be condescending. Why aren't you singing? I've actually heard some cantors say that. And it's terrible. You turn people off. You don't want to turn people off. Put on the charm. Be careful with the mic. Don't sing so close to the mic. After the people master song, back off from the mic and let them own the song. So you've taught the uh, holy, holy, and you're going to sing that now in mass. Do you teach anything else that first Sunday? No. You don't want to overwhelm people with teaching. What you do is you're going to introduce three new movements of the Mass on this first Sunday. The Holy Holy, which you teach, and then the mystery of faith. We're going to do we proclaim, and then the Amen. But for the mystery of faith, for this first Sunday, the first couple of Sundays, sing it twice. Don't teach it beforehand, but at the actual part of the liturgy, sing it twice. Have your choir sing it once. Then the people come in. Let's demonstrate that now with We Proclaim Your Death. So this is right at, uh, after uh, the words of institution, the priest has changed the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ. The people haven't heard this yet, but they have an idea of the motif because you taught them the holy. Now we're actually at the proclamation of faith. 
the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Okay. So this mass setting in particular has such a strong melodic motif that by this point, I think people are going to get it. Let's now go into the great amen. What we used to call the great amen is now simply called amen. We're going to sing the doxology. And uh, the priest will hopefully have learned this beforehand. I'm going to talk about that a little later. And we'll just do, again, we'll sing the amen twice. We're going to demonstrate now the priest's part of the doxology and then go right into the amen. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Congratulations, you have taught your people three movements of a new mass setting. Okay. Now, the next Sunday, sing those three movements again, the second Sunday, but now teach the gospel acclamation, the Alleluia, the outside side of Lent, of course. And we're going to demonstrate that for you right now. And we're going to throw in the verse too so you can hear how it sounds. But before mass on that second Sunday, sing that alleluia, and then ask the people to join in. The idea of, of actually teaching it a little portion every Sunday is to engage your people, let them be a part of this. So I'm going to teach that right now. the second Sunday, simply sing the Lamb of God. Don't teach it, but sing it at the breaking of the bread during the actual liturgy. And then continue um, singing it, of course, from then on. And again, because the melodic motif is so strong in this Mass, people will pick it up during the repetition. And remember, watch the tempo markings. The Lamb of God is a little slower than the other parts of the Mass of this setting. Thank you. 
so by the end of the second Sunday, the, the people know the holy, the mystery of faith, amen. They have sung the gospel acclamation. They have sung the Lamb of God. Third Sunday, that's when we're going to go through the glory to God. Now, um, as you might be aware, there are two approaches to the glory to God. One is to sing it antiphonally, that is, with a refrain, and the other is for the people to sing the whole text, what's referred to as through sung, without a refrain, the people sing the whole thing. Certainly, pastorally, the antiphonal approach uh, allows the people to enter into the glory to God immediately. And you notice those of you who have sung a uh, mass setting with an antiphonal glory to God, for example, mass of glory, you'll notice after a few weeks, people sing those verses anyway. So what Dan Schutte has done with his mass setting here is he has done it both antiphonally and through sung. What I want to do right now is Scott and I are going to sh demonstrate the refrain uh, for the glory to God, and then we're going to demonstrate how this sounds as a through sung Gloria. So uh, let's just uh, go through the uh, refrain first. And then you will invite the people, this is before Mass, invite the people to join in on that. And maybe sing it antiphonally for the first couple of Sundays. But as they get familiar with it, invite them to join in on the verses too. So Scott and I are going to demonstrate now how this Gloria sounds through sun. Some of you might not have even tried this yet, but it's really a good thing to do to empower your people to sing the actual text of the whole glory to God. So we're going to do that now as through sun. challenge to do the uh, Gloria as a through sun and through sun format, but until the St. Louis Jesuits themselves popularized the antiphonal setting in the 1970s, that's how we were singing the Glory to God before. Uh, it's very easy to do. Trust that your people will be able to learn it. it it's, uh, 
good for them to own the whole text of the glory to God. I do want to teach one last thing, and this is the, for the fourth Sunday, the Lord have mercy or penitential act. Um, this setting in Mass of uh, Christ the Savior is very easy. It's call and response. We're going to demonstrate it as the penitential act right now so you can hear it. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord have mercy. Have mercy. interesting things with tempo that Dan's doing here. It takes a little bit of a uh, kind of look at those shifting tempos. It'll be a very interesting composition. Um, so congratulations. Over the course of four Sundays, you've taught your people a new mass setting. It is a month-long rollout, okay, uh, to teach a new mass setting at your assembly. Don't think you're going to do it all in one Sunday. Two months if you include the website and bulletin pre-promotion. So this might seem like a long time, but the effort invested will result in a parish that will truly own the singing of the new mass setting. And don't forget our priests. Let us not forget to include them in the learning process. Too often the priest is left out of the pre-liturgy song teaching because he's vesting in the sacristy or greeting people as they enter the church. Now, most priests like to sing along with the people, so please take care to give Father a CD or an MP3 link to new music well ahead of time so he can prepare. And especially if he's a singing priest, he'll want to know how that doxology before the amen goes. So make sure that he is equipped with everything he needs to learn that new mass setting. I'm trying to be conscious of time right now, and I do want to leave room for your questions that are pouring in and so I'm just going to give you a little sampler of different mass settings. Uh, we're going to look at Ricky Manalo's Mass of Spirit and Grace. If you have Breaking Bread, that's Breaking Bread number 933. And we only have time to go over the Holy right now. Again, uh, the Holy uh, has a central motif of the whole Mass. And uh, we'll just demonstrate that for you right now. Uh, it goes like this. Multilingual intercession. Uh, general intercession is not official text, but especially in parishes, uh, we have a lot of different cultural groups uh, that are part of the parish. Sometimes a very simple response like this will unite your assembly. Uh, it has, Ricky has written it with uh, several languages in mind, he says, available in 30 languages. So it's available on OCP.org. We're going to sing it for you in English, Filipino, Latin, and Spanish, okay? We'll just demonstrate that for you right now. I don't know if you can see the music clearly on your screen, but we'll demonstrate to give you an idea of what it sounds like. Six. 
some of the options out there. Father Ricky's ministry is to bring different communities and different cultural traditions together. He does a wonderful job of that. I was just with him in the Philippines and saw him in action. We're beginning to run out of time. Um, many of you know Mass of Renewal. I know it's a contemporary setting. I don't think we have time to sing it right now. But that glory to God that Curtis has uh, composed here has become very popular. It's through sung. I encourage you you can listen to it if you're new to this. You can listen to it on ocp.org or spiritandsong.com. Um, I do want to go over a Lenten gospel acclamation, and this is by Steve Angrosano and Tom Tomazak for Mass of a Joyful Heart. Uh, as you know, we don't say or sing Alleluia during Lent. Um, and here is an example of an acclamation that two have created for Lent which is in the motif of their very guitar-based mass setting. Uh, so we're just going to demonstrate that for you now. sure you probably know this mass setting, Mass of a Joyful Heart. Um, and we really are running out of time. I do want to go over a multicultural mass setting. Uh, this is by Mary Frances Reza. It's called Misa Santa Fe, and you'll find it in Breaking Bread, number 905. And what is beautiful about this mass setting is that she has written it bilingually, both in Spanish and English. And, you know, some people think, oh, that's a wonderful idea, bilingual music settings. But, you know, isn't that hard? Like, if you speak English, it's hard to do the Spanish part. Or if you speak Spanish, it's hard to do the English part. What Mary Frances Reza has done here is created a setting which can be sung all in Spanish or all in English or when the time calls for it, bilingually, Spanish and English. So it's quite possible during the course of a year for the people in your Spanish Mass to learn this Mass setting in Spanish, and on that same Sunday, the people in the English Mass to learn this Mass setting in English. And when you come together at Midnight Mass for Christmas, or on Holy Saturday for the Easter Vigil, both communities will already know this and can put it together as part of the bilingual setting. We're going to demonstrate it for you in Spanish right now, and then we'll uh, do it in English. Heaven, earth. 
example of the many possibilities out there to bring your communities together with a mass setting. And finally, we do want to demonstrate for you the honest day from the chant mass. Now, those of you who are uh, very much into the contemporary music, you might think, well, why is it important to sing Latin? I mean, I mentioned that earlier, it is, it remains the official language of the Roman Catholic Church. And even for young people to own at least the Lamb of God, the On You Stay, is important. I have a youth choir in my parish. For years during Lent, we have been singing the On You Stay. And at first they were reluctant about it, but now every Lent they look forward to it. Okay? And they, they know they're part of a larger church beyond time and place. That's why it's important to sing. He's to learn these Gregorian chants. So we're going to, Scott's going to demonstrate the Anya States in Breaking Bread number 859. On your stay, qui tolis peccata mundi, Miserere nobis, Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, Dona nobis pacem. Well, thank you, Scott. Um, You're welcome. Is, yeah, it's been great to have you. It's great to have everybody here. It, it, this has just been a sampling um, there are so many other masses I wanted to share. Mass of the Sacred Heart by Timothy R. Smith, my own Mass of the Most Holy Trinity, a, a traditional Mass, very different from Mass of Glory. We just run out of time, but you can find them on ocp.org. What we do want to do is take some time to answer your questions. So uh, uh, my friend Jethro here is going to read some of the questions you've been sending in, and I'll try to answer them. So just a, little <clears throat> just a little housekeeping real quick. Um, there's a lot of questions about whether this will be available in video format and the slides. Both of those will be available on ocp.org slash webinars um, coming up after this webinar. Um, and also, uh, there's been, um, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Here's the first question, Ken. And we have a lot of questions, so um, we may not get to everybody's question, and we do apologize if we run out of time. The first question is, how do you pronounce the A in Amen when singing in English? Is there a rule to the pronunciation? That's a very good question, and a lot of that, the answer is based on the uh, style and motif of music in which you're using. For example, if you're singing the Amen in a song or mass setting that is gospel-based, of the African-American culture, amen, is certainly appropriate. Uh, musically speaking, it's uh, much easier to sing amen. Uh, that fits a little better musically in many, many settings, many songs. But it really depends also what part of the world in, you're in. In England, for example, they pronounce English very differently from the way Americans pronounce it. Uh, in the Philippines, which is an English-speaking country, they pronounce English a little differently. So. It depends on your community, it depends on the style and motif. There's no rule, quote unquote, for the correct pronunciation of the amen. And I remember what I was going to tell everyone. For the slides that we skipped in Ken's presentation today, those will be in the slide deck afterwards if you'd like to review those mass settings that we had to skip over in, in consideration for time. So the next question, Ken, is on the second Sunday in, in your pattern of teaching um, mass settings, uh, do you sing the acclamations at Mass or just before Mass until the whole Mass is taught? And this kind of ties into a couple of questions about 
the breakdown of that four week process of teaching. So maybe we could just um, run through it again sure. um, real quickly. I'd be glad to. Uh, on the first Sunday, I suggest that you teach the Holy, 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 and then uh, sing, just sing without teaching, the mystery of faith acclamation and the Amen. But sing it twice. Sing, uh, we proclaim twice. Sing, Amen, twice. Do you suggest singing that during Mass or before Mass? Be during Mass. During, during mass, mass, yeah. Just teach the Holy before Mass, because you don't want to overwhelm the people with teaching. Okay, just teach one thing. If you must teach something before Mass, uh, keep it minimal. And then the second Sunday, uh, then you repeat those three, but then uh, teach the Alleluia, or the Lenten Gospel Mation, and then during Mass, sing the Lamb of God, and the people will pick that up. The third Sunday, teach the glory to God, but sing everything else you've been teaching. And then fourth Sunday, uh, teach the Lord have mercy, but sing everything else you've been teaching. So Ken, what are your thoughts on mixing movements from different Mass settings? Well, when you're in the process, that's a very good question, when you're in the process of teaching a new mass setting, that can't be helped. If you're going to teach it with a gradual rollout, you know, starting with the holy mystery of faith, amen, then uh, you don't want to leave the other parts of the mass blank. You know, continue with the mass setting you're currently on. So after you teach Mass of Christ the Savior that first Sunday, you might be doing Mass of Glory for the other mass part. Continue singing those. It's a transitional time. Ideally, once your people own a mass setting, then you want to stay to that particular mass because of the melodic motif that's involved. Uh, there are some exceptions. You know your parish best. That's what I always say. But I ideally, try to stay within one mass setting throughout one liturgy. Yes. So um, based on the four weeks of, of teaching the mass setting, there's concern over um, teaching Easter music during Lent. Uh, for example, what are your thoughts on, on that? Uh, do not teach Easter music during Lent. <laughs> Obviously, you're not going to want to teach an Alleluia during Lent. Or if you're talking about a choir, you know, teaching, uh, certainly during choir rehearsal, yes, you have to learn. For example, my parish always sings Handel's uh, Hallelujah Chorus. Well, we have to practice that during the six weeks of Lent if we're going to really sing it well at the Easter Vigil. Uh, we're not going to substitute the word Alleluia during rehearsal. Rehearsal is okay because we are getting ready for the actual liturgy, but not during liturgy. Do not sing Alleluia or any Easter song during Lenten liturgy, no. Um, we have another question. Um, are there any considerations for singing the Our Father among these Mass settings? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, not, I mean, looking through this, I don't see too many mass settings that have include, included a setting of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Christopher Walker's Celtic Mass has a setting of the Lord's Prayer, but as a general rule, the composers have kind of kept their hands off the Lord's Prayer. Uh, there's several reasons for that. We don't have time to go over that. But right now what has emerged in the Roman Catholic Church is Our Father number two. Our Father who art in heaven. That is the universal English setting of the Lord's Prayer in the American Catholic Church, probably throughout the English-speaking world. Um, and there's something to be said about the unity of every single congregation singing that one setting of the Lord's Prayer. I kind of like that myself. So I'm sorry to say we don't have too many other Our Fathers in these new Mass settings, and I think the composers did that on purpose uh, to give way to the chant setting of the Lord's Prayer for the Universal Church. Great. So when um, deciding which mystery of faith to use in the Mass setting, what are your considerations for that? That's another excellent question. Uh, each uh, mystery of faith has a certain feel for a particular liturgical season. You can sing any of the three at any time. But for example, during Lent, you might want to sing Save a Savior because it mentions the cross. On Holy Thursday, or at First Communion, you might want to sing When We Eat This Bread, for obvious reasons. During Year B in August in North and Northern Hemisphere, well actually, Year B in August throughout the English-speaking world, we're going to hear from John chapter 6 for four weeks, Jesus is teaching on the bread of life. That would be an appropriate place to sing, an appropriate time to sing, When We Eat This Bread. Uh, we Proclaim is kind of a generic, it has become the generic acclamation there. But look at the seasons and see what would fit in. I think it's okay to do that. Great. Um, do you have any suggestions for choosing mass settings for liturgy at Catholic elementary schools? 
elementary school. Now that is a, that's a very good question. You're all asking terrific questions. Um, when I was a uh, pastor and musician at St. Mary Magdalene, I did, took care of the school mass here in Portland and we tried various mass settings and it was very difficult for the kids until we landed on Mass of Glory, which I didn't think they would catch. Uh, but just doing that week after week, because it has a beat, it's gospelly, uh, the kids really like that. I know in some of our children's resources, I believe, Never Too Young or Rise Up and Sing, there are some suggestions for Mass settings in those books. You might want to look at that. That's certainly an area that OCP wants to look at. We want to serve our schools and our children in liturgy, so we're certainly always looking for a new ways we can serve that constituency. So we have a question um, about uh, music directors and their priests. Um, the question is, my priest suggests only singing the Gloria during the joyous seasons of Christmas and Easter. Do you have any thoughts on that? According to the Roman Missal, uh, the glory to God is preferably sung on any Sunday when it's allowed, outside of Advent or Lent. Uh, certainly it can be recited. Um, this is a local custom question. If you've been in liturgy long enough, I know some of you have, I've been in this for 30, 40 years, there's always that escape clause, according to local custom, quote, unquote. Um, but the Roman Missal does prescribe that the glory to God is to be sung on any Sunday except Advent or Lent. So that's something, uh, my friend, you need to work out with your pastor, if he has a preference to sing it only in the joyful times. Perhaps a, a compromise would be to pull out the most joyous glorias during uh, Easter and Christmas and something a bit more prayerful or reflective outside of those seasons. So dialogue, you know, talk with them, talk with each other. Um, we're getting close to time here. Um, we're, we apologize that we couldn't get to all of your questions, but the slide decks will be available as well as a video. Um, on ocp.org slash webinars um, next week. And uh, thank you, Jethro, and thank all of you. I have uh, some announcements here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to learn more about introducing mass settings. Uh, as Jethro said, we're sorry we couldn't get through all the questions, uh, but just email us at ocp.org. Slides and videos of the webinar will be posted in a few days, and the next webinar is February 24th at 9 a.m. Pacific time the topic is Answers for Liturgical and Choir Music Planning by presenter Angela Westhoff Johnson. I'm sure you don't want to miss that. She's a terrific pastoral musician, director of music at the Cathedral here in Portland. We do have a survey. Please let us know how you felt about this webinar. We'll be sending you a survey that we encourage you to reply to. As always, we value your input.